So it's going to be a different kind of Mel Robbins training because normally I come in so high energy and I'm super excited to, to share everything that I've learned, the hard stuff, the easy stuff. And when I saw that the topic today is about advanced wellness strategies for home and for work, um, I thought, you know, this is going to be a potentially very boring training. And let me tell you why. The things that you need to do in order to increase wellness, confidence, purpose, a sense of control when it comes to day-to-day -day habits in your home life or at work are really boring on their face. And so I am coming out of the gates to say that because the more successful I have become, the happier I have become, the more boring my life looks on paper. I'm not kidding. The things I'm about to share with you are not sexy. They are not exciting, but they are the foundation for everything that you want and that you deserve in your life. So we're going to talk first, okay, when it comes to wellness, about something that you may not think a lot about. Because when you're building a business, when you're going for your dreams, when you are pursuing a big passionate life, you think about all the stuff that you're doing, right? One of the most important things when it comes to wellness strategies for home and for work is sleep, period. The more successful that I've become, the, you know, the more boring my life looks and the more sleep that I get. My husband and I are in bed by 9.30 on most nights. And the reason why is because I know the science around sleep. Now, it's kind of boring to, to tell it to you, so I'm going to just give you some of the highlights. It is impossible for your brain, for your body, and for your spirit to do what it's been designed to do if you have not given it the rest that it deserves. The research on this is just something you can't argue with. It is so horrible for your brain when you do not get a good night's sleep. Uh, the research shows that not only does it impact your mood, but when you do not have enough sleep, let's talk with uh, you know an all-nighter. If you've ever pulled an all-nighter, I used to be the queen of the all-nighters in college and in law school. When you pull an all-nighter, the all-nighter's impact on your brain is the equivalent to head trauma. It actually shrinks your prefrontal cortex, the part of the brain that you need in order to be able to focus, in order to be able to learn new behavior. And so sleep is essential. If you want to be successful, you must prioritize your sleep. If you want a sense of wellness and in health, you must prioritize your sleep. I, I read this study once that if you've got three days in a row where you get less than six hours of sleep at night, it is the equivalent of being legally drunk when it comes to your speed of processing, your ability to focus. And so one of these foundational principles when it comes to your success and your wellness, both at home and at work, is you making sleep a serious priority. So what are some tactical takeaways? You know, I'm gonna steal something from Brandon that he posted that you may have seen on his, uh, uh, his Instagram page because it is an excellent summary of what we call a wind down routine. Morning routines right now are all the rage. How many of you have a morning routine, right? You rely on your morning routine. How you set your day up is how the day ends up. But your morning routine doesn't begin in the morning, everybody. It begins the night before. It begins with you going to bed at a reasonable hour and it begins with you completing your day and winding your day down in a way that sets you up for success. Brendan posted this post that I just love that he called the three, two, one formula. Three hours before bed, you stop eating. Two hours before bed, you stop working. One hour before bed, no more screens. And you wanna know why? Anything that's on a screen is somebody else's dream. 
Your dreams deserve a great night's sleep. Your dreams deserve your focus and attention. And so I want you to be mindful about how you wind down your day. The three, two, one principle from Brendan, we're stealing it here. One hour beforehand, you're gonna turn off your screens. The next thing that I want you to do is absolutely no phone in the bedroom. You're gonna hear me talk about this incessantly. And the reason why is you're addicted to it. This does not belong in your bedroom, okay? And the reason why I don't want it in the bedroom is because I want you to have a good night's sleep. And if this is in arm's reach, you're gonna lay in bed and look at it. And that's gonna interrupt your ability to sleep. In addition, the blue light for this uh, on the phone, even when you're asleep, it interrupts your ability to drift into the deeper REM sleep. And you wanna know the, the actual purpose of sleep, everybody. It has to do with, with focus. This is so fascinating when you understand it. Of course, we know that you need rest, right? Of course, we know that you've got to put yourself to bed so that your body can rest. You need it. But do you know the real reason why your brain needs you to sleep? I'm going to tell you. When you're asleep, half of your brain can turn off and go into an autopilot mode. And the other half of your brain gets to go to work doing something critically important for your success. While this part of the brain is on autopilot and asleep, this part of the brain takes your experience from today and starts filing away all of the things that happened to you today, all the memories, all of the lessons, all of the skill building, absolutely everything that happened to you today gets filed away like books returning to a library system. If you didn't sleep, you wouldn't have any memories. And so it's critically important for your ability to focus, for your ability to build knowledge, for your ability to become stronger and more resilient, for your ability to be productive, for you to sleep so that you can take everything that happened today and while you're busy sleeping, you can store it away as knowledge that you're building on. So let's talk about going to bed. And I realize this is probably not what you thought we were gonna talk about, but I can't tell you how important this is. When you go to bed, you're not gonna have this next to you because we're gonna talk about what's gonna happen in the morning when you wake up for yourself a concept that I invented, that I love. It's a whole philosophy about getting out of bed. This isn't gonna be near you. And what I want you to do before you go to bed is I want you every single night to set your alarm intentionally. You see, how many of you have, get up at the same time every morning? Every morning is the same time. It's like getting up is on autopilot too. Every single night, I want you to get present to tomorrow morning. I want you to get present to what you actually need in the morning to set yourself up. And I want you to set your alarm intentionally for that time that is going to be the amount of time that gives you enough time to do absolutely every single thing that you need to do for yourself. Because if you're anything like I used to be, I used to be you know, one of those people that would set the alarm knowing that I was gonna hit the snooze alarm four times in the morning. And then I was going to spring out of bed and somehow try to do an hour's worth of stuff in a matter of 10 minutes flat. And so my day already started in a panic attack. That's not how you practice wellness. That's not how you practice success. So every night, it's not the same alarm. It's what's going to serve me and my dreams and the things that I need to do tomorrow. Confidence is a skill that you can build using simple, repetitive tasks and thinking tools. And you can start building it today. I want you to just settle in for a second, ground yourself in this moment, and I want you to think about what is something that you want to make happen this year in your life? What is the one thing that if, if Mel Robbins could wave her sparkly lip gloss and I could give you the next level of confidence, okay? What is that thing that you really wanna create 
in your life for real and write it down. I see write a book. I see retire. I see uh, have 10 to 15 coaching clients, be a speaker, sell my art. All of it is achievable. How do I know that? Because somebody else in the world is doing it. If someone else in the world is doing what you dream of doing, you have evidence that it is possible for you. And here's what I know about your dreams. Your dreams are deeply personal. And when you have dreams that are deeply personal, that are meant for you, that pull you like an arrow is pulled towards a target, you only have two choices. You either got to figure out how to level up your confidence and start working toward it, or those dreams will haunt you. Because I personally believe, I'm writing a book about this right now, that when you're born, your dreams are woven into your DNA. They're preset. There is a life that is meant for you. And your dreams are trying to pull you toward this. And what's super, super cool about getting in touch with your dreams when it relates to confidence is that, you know, your dreams are just things that you can achieve if you work toward them. And so if you're not working toward your dreams, if you don't have your dreams already achieved, here's what I know. There's something about you that is blocked right now. And that's okay. Thinking about your dreams will haunt you. Getting out of the thinking habit and into the action habit, that is what will change your life. And so here's the next thing I want to do. I want you to now level up even more because I bet the way that you wrote your dreams down, I bet you even shrunk it a little. I bet your self doubt. And your insecurity made you write a dream that was a little bit smaller than what you actually want, right? I know this because I do the same damn thing to myself. Of course I do. You know, I, I, I think about, you know, what my big dreams are and I go, oh, well, you know, what do I really want? I want my next book to be a massive success. I want it to dominate the bestseller list for at least 10 weeks. That's my big, big, big dream. But what I say is, oh, I'd love to, you know, make the New York Times bestseller list. I shrink it because my self-doubt and my insecurity even starts to block me when I dream. You feel the pull of your dream, but then you say this to yourself, it will never happen for me. There's a relationship between confidence, which pushes you forward, and self-doubt, which blocks you. And this is why self-doubt is such a killer, because you know what you want. You can feel what you want. You are jealous of people that have it. You are pulled toward that thing that you want. And your doubt is blocking you by actively convincing you it won't happen for you. So let's talk a little bit about confidence, okay? First of all, I've already said it's a skill. It doesn't matter if you were born the most insecure, thumb-sucking, abused, pathetic soul of a human being. You can build the skill of confidence. It doesn't matter if you came out of the womb super ego-driven and larger than life and confident and all that stuff. You still have a lot of work to do when it comes to confidence, authentic confidence. So let me talk to you about what is the skill of confidence. My definition of confidence is not belief in self. I love evidence-based advice because I'm kind of skeptical. I looked at the research on confidence, okay? And there's really good news here. The first thing you've already learned, it's a skill. The second thing that you are gonna learn that's really good is it's, it's very simple to build the skill of confidence. And you can do it through repetitive actions every day, very simple little things that will slowly build up the reservoir of confidence. And here's the definition I wanna give you of confidence. Confidence is the willingness to try. That's it. And the reason why I like this definition is because this definition is based in the research around confidence. So if you want to learn more about this, Google 
confidence competency loop. This is my fancy little graphic, okay? This is what we call a confidence competency loop. I did not invent this. This is something that people who research confidence for a living have created. And I've highlighted this because this is where confidence begins. It begins with the willingness to try, because I'm going to show you what ends up happening if you're the kind of person who trains yourself. Notice the words I'm using, trains. We're not going to sit around and wait for motivation. We're not going to wait for courage. We're going to manufacture those things. And this is where the five second rule is so transformative. All you do is in a moment where you feel doubt, insecurity, fear, anxiety, procrastination, perfectionism, PTSD, OCD, anything that you might possibly have that would rise up to block you, you simply count backwards, five, four, three, two, one, okay? And you gotta count backwards, five, four, three, two, one, and what that will do is it will shift gears in your mind. Instead of being stuck here in the part of the brain that keeps you stuck worrying and thinking and having a bias towards overthinking and being a perfectionist, you're going to go one, four, or five, four, three, two, one, and you're going to try. The first time you try, you will fail. That's really good news. You want to know why? You learn by failing. Do you realize that's how you've always learned? That when you were a kid, you don't remember this, but when you were learning to walk, you fell an average of 17 times an hour. And so you learn everything when you fail, because when you fail, as much as you may think you're going to die, if you stand on a stage, I see a lot of you who want to be coaches or speakers or whatever, you're going to have to learn how to give a speech where you stutter and where your, your mouth gets really dry and pasty and where you get a neck rash and where you forget what you're supposed to say. You got to do all that stuff. Why? Because when you fail, you don't die. You actually gain knowledge and experience. And that's the gift of failure. Because you then take that knowledge and that experience and you go right back to the next time. And then you try again. But this time when you five, four, three, two, one, try, you're going to take your knowledge and experience with you and you're going to fail a little bit less. And what you're going to learn there, you're going to take right back to the next time that you try. You five, four, three, two, one. You push yourself to try. You gain a little bit of competency for the next time you're going to do it. And every time you gain a little bit of competency, your mastery goes up. And that's when you start to feel more self-assured. And that muscle, everybody, of trying, that is where you build the skill of confidence. I'm going to talk about my philosophy about leadership, because when I hear the word leadership, I think about influence. So let's first talk about what does the word influence actually mean, okay? So influence is the power that you have to affect the actions, behaviors, and opinions of other people. In short, it means you have the influence to move somebody from point A to point B. Now, there are two kinds of influence that all leaders have. Internal influence, and that's the power that you have over yourself. And in my opinion, this type of influence is the single most important type of influence to practice and cultivate that will impact your ability to impact others. Internal influence is your ability to move yourself from point A to point B. Because one of the things about being a great leader is knowing how to be flexible, knowing how to change, knowing how to pivot, knowing how to grow. And that means you've got to have influence over yourself. The other type of influence is external influence. And that is your ability to move other people from point A to point B. You know, we all have had these experiences, right? Where we've uh, been around other leaders. We've been around people that have had that implied influence, right? Because of their position, because of their title. But I guarantee you, 
you've had the experience where you've had to work for or been around another leader, but they have not been that influential on you. They were either a jerk or a micromanager, or they showed up in a way that made you feel awful. You have had that experience. And one of the reasons why I want to hammer home this point, that it doesn't matter who you are, where you are, what you do, leadership, the best kind of leadership and the most powerful kind of influence is the type that's earned. It has nothing to do with your position. It has nothing to do with your title. It has everything to do with how you show up and the way in which you treat other people. I want you to understand that the most important aspect of raising your influence and of becoming a better and a more influential leader is deciding that you want to be and claiming that that leadership role in your life. When you look at leadership, and Brendan's right, it's super important that you're a student your whole life, that leadership is something that you should study. When you start to look into leadership, you're going to see that there's all kinds of books, there's all kinds of philosophies, there are servant-based leaders, there are transformational leaders, there are situational leaders, there are people who are authoritarian leaders, there's a bazillion different leadership styles. Well, what I want you to think about is what kind of leader do you want to be? And there are two questions that I think are important for you to ask yourself. And the reason why it's important for you to ask yourself these two questions is because they will give you a roadmap that maps to your values and maps to your goals and maps to who you are in terms of cultivating a leadership style, okay? So here are the two questions. Number one, when you leave a room, what do you want people to say about you? And these are really important and I'm going to explain why. So for me, when I leave a room, what do I want people to say about me? Oh my gosh, she's authentic. She's smart. She's inspiring. She's fun. Um, I want to work with her. I love her. Like that's the kind of vibe. Those are the adjectives. And it's important for you to answer that question authentically for you. What do you want people to say about you when you leave a room? Because to me, embedded in that description is the roadmap to the type of leader that you want to be. And I guarantee you, what Brendan would say in answer to that question is different than what I would say. And it's different than what you would say. I see motivating, caring, informative, inspiring, happy, and confident. These are really important words for you to think about. And here's why. Once you answer that question, what do you want people to say about you when you leave a room? You now have, you now have this roadmap, as I've mentioned, and you can use a very powerful body of research called behavioral activation therapy, BAT. The shorthand for BAT, I talk about it a lot in my training, is act like the person you want to become. It sounds supremely stupid and simple. Everything I talk about is. And oftentimes the greatest change always comes from the simple, obvious stuff. If you want people to say that you are inspiring, happy, and confident, or you are fun, positive, and kind, act like that person. Research shows that simply setting an intention at the beginning of the day about who you want to be today, what are those words you want people to say about you when you leave the room? Wow, that Mel Robbins, she is so authentic. She is just herself. She is so smart. She is so inspiring. She's so fun to be. I really want to work with her. I just, that is critical for you to write down. Now let's talk about the second one. Okay, because this is going to measure the impact that you want to make. Okay, so the first one is sort of giving you the roadmap to uh, acting like the kind of leader, the sort of leadership style. Now we're going to talk about impact, and that is how do you want people to feel when they're around you? See, the first question was about you and your reputation. The second one is about the impact that you make in people how you're perceived. For me, I want people to leave 
feeling empowered, seen, and inspired. And if I had to ask, you know, like do another one, it would be energized and appreciated. So what are the words that describe how you want people to feel when they are around you? You see, another metaphor, and I love metaphors too, is leadership and influence is all about action and intention. And a metaphor that I like to think about when I think about leadership and influence is, you know, we have this awesome dog named Yolo. He is literally one of the greatest things that's ever happened to me. Um, he's two years old, so he's just coming out of the puppy stage. He's an Australian shepherd. And we've had lots of dogs in our life. And we have this awesome cat named Mr. Noodle. They're all over my Instagram stories if you follow me online. But he is just joyous. When I wake up at five o'clock in the morning to this dog panting back and forth in the bedroom because he wants to go outside, he's so excited. The second he hears me stir, he's like up on the bed. He's super excited. And I take him for a walk every morning and we're down uh, vacationing this month and we're right by the ocean. Uh, and, and one of the greatest things that I do every morning is I walk the dog. And so I throw the ball and he runs in and out of the ocean. And, you know, if you've ever been around a dog and a dog runs into the ocean and runs down the, the sand and then runs back into the ocean, what does a dog do when they're wet? They like shake, right? They shake. And then pff, sand and ocean water and seaweed and everything that's on the dog goes spraying off in every direction. It gets all over everything. Your leadership and influence style is the exact same way. You are sprinkling it and spreading it everywhere you go. And so it's so important for you to answer these questions. How do you want people to feel? when they're around you, because that is the ocean and the sand and everything that shakes off you as you're moving around through your day-to-day -day life. And if you want to make sure that people feel, and I see this, playful, at peace, empowered, good, you need to be intentional about causing that in people. This can be your day for personal growth. This can be that day you committed to and you remember and you go, that was the day I got myself a community. I got better coaches. I committed to making my life the absolute best that I could. This is that day. Make today your growth day. Click the button on this page and sign up right now.